Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today it's my great honor to have Chaitanya Charan Prabhu on. He has a podcast of his own. He's a great bhakti educator and scholar uh, of Hare Krishna ideas and Chaitanya Vaishnavism. And today we're going to be talking about what we were titling it, a Jordan Peterson style approach to Bhagavad Gita, psychological insights from the Vedas. So Chaitanya Charan, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Arjun, Arjun for, for inviting me. You know, I appreciate your podcast because you are at the cutting edge of the interface of Bhakti theology with contemporary issues and concerns. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. So I am from India and uh, I've been a monk for almost 25 years, been traveling across the world, uh, primarily speaking on the Bhagavad Gita and other text related with bhakti wisdom so i'm especially grateful that we can discuss about jordan peterson because for three broad reasons i find he, that there's many things in his approach which echo the gita's uh, which echo the gita's approach to the study of reality and then there is so that this approach then his analysis the way he does that and then the application that he arrives at. So I would like to discuss these three things, approach, analysis and application in terms of parallels between Jordan Peterson and Bhagavad Gita, if that's okay with you. Sounds good. Um, so perhaps we should start by saying who Jordan Peterson is. I've done a, a couple of videos on him already, but uh, a couple of people were like, who's Jordan Peterson? Okay, yeah. Mm. So... Jordan Peterson is considered by some as one of the most influential intellectuals in today's world. He is a Canadian clinical psychologist who rose to fame because of taking on some politically volatile issues with respect to uh, <clears throat> what he felt was over excessive legislation of speech. But subsequently, he has become more acclaimed for his, uh, we could say, inspirational, motivational, psychological, analytical talks. And especially he has appealed to a lot of young people to take up responsibility in their lives and try to live more meaningful lives. So his books, uh, especially his uh, 12 Rules for Life and then his subsequent Beyond, Beyond Order, those two books have been done quite well. He traveled across the world at, and he had very good responses in his tours and also, he he's not a religious. He doesn't say that he explicitly is religious, but he draws from Bible uh, extensively, and that is also significant about how one could draw wisdom, not necessarily theology or religion, from wisdom from sacred texts of a tradition, and then present it in a contemporary way. So that's what. Cool. Um, I thought one interesting question to get us started on psychology and insights from the Vedas would be to ask why there's so much rise, so much increase in mental illness these days. Uh, I shared with you a tweet that someone made an interesting comment in relation to that question saying, it's a combination of factors, poor parenting, immense wealth, and a lack of purpose. My generation, I was born in 85, suffered and gained a lot from suffering. Very few people in the in the US today suffer and characters built upon the framework of getting up after falling down. Mm. So this is something which uh, I have pondered a lot. And uh, one thing which struck me, as I said, I, I was from India. And in India also, if you consider in the, pow in the relatively uh, rural parts of the country, there is still a lot of poverty. But it is ironic that mental health problems are much more in the urban parts of India than in the rural parts. And similarly, for Indians who immigrate to various parts of the world, be it Australia or New Zealand or especially America, UK, Canada, they seem to have mental health problems more than Indians in India. Now, of course, these are generalizations and there could be other factors like, say, in rural parts of India, mental health problems, mental health services themselves are not available. So you, they, the problems are not diagnosed. But that, uh, that is, even considering that factor, one of my biggest understandings is this is that for the mind to be peaceful, there has to be a certain level of structure in the outer world. 
and the less the structure in the outer world the greater will be you can say the rupture in our inner world the disorder so a simple example would be say if we are driving on a road and the, the, the everybody is following the rules properly then we can drive very peacefully now we can you can even have to talk on phone or hear audio book or do other things but if you are driving on a road where not only are people not following rules properly but what the rules themselves are is not clear then driving on the road will be a source of great anxiety so what has happened for us is that many of the things which provided some kind of structure and order to life for for i would say not even generations or decades or millennia in fact we could say they have become destabilized and destroyed even denigrated in the postmodern world modern and even further postmodern world and that is often a cause of mental stress that is not talked about so much so this is where the bhagavad gita comes in and bhagavad gita states in its 16th chapter that in ang- that uh, anxiety chintam aparimeyam ch krishna says that in the gita that anxiety becomes immeasurable when chintam aparimeyam ch pralayantam upashrita and this goes on till the moment of destruction moment of death when does that happen when desire becomes unfettered from rules or guidelines kamopa bhoga parama etavadit nishchita we all have desires and desire itself is not a bad thing desire is what moves us it makes it drives us it makes us do things but when there is no framework no structure for guiding our desires then that those very desires become the cause of unlimited anxieties am i making sense what i'm saying yeah that makes sense yep one thing i heard jordan peterson say a little bit related to that what related to the tweet more is um it's difficult to know how much privation to give our children in other words previously before industrialization there was difficulty in life just there and we were always trying to give our lives as make the lives of our children as easy as possible and give them the best possible future yes. but today with modern technology we can make it so our children basically don't have to do a heck of a lot and this takes away a sense of meaning and purpose because it doesn't really matter if they get up and do things or not they're still going to be fed people around them are still going to be fed and clothed so then there's a lack of meaning or purpose as the question is there whether i'm actually contributing or whether my actions actually matter for other people because everything's fine whether i get up and work or not Yes that is true you know i'll just come to that point of privation a little later but even the his book title rules for life mm. you know the modern idea is or the contemporary idea is i don't want rules i just want to i want to live my life but the idea that a book which had title in its title rules is so popular indicates that we all need as i said a rule can be seen as restrictive or rule can be seen as a guideline so if i am going on a if we are, if say we are trying to climb up a mountain and if there is a pathway to go up the mountain then somebody might see the pathway is restrictive why can't i go cross country why can't i go by own way well you can but there is a pathway already there it will be easier it will be safer so similarly rules if we can see them positively as providing us as pathways for moving ahead in life and the bhagavad gita itself states that towards the end that uh into in that same 16 chapter in the last verse he says that to the extent we harmonize with time tested guidelines to that extent you know, we can have peace we can have purpose and then we can have prosperity prosperity doesn't just mean wealth in terms of outer riches but also in terms of as you said meaning a meaning a meaningfully rich life so that is one part that now of course rules if they are just uh, something which is foisted upon somebody by their religion or by their culture or by their tradition then that is a problem but the point is that if there is no structure in life then the mind goes wild that's one aspect of it and the second aspect 
I'll come to that about privation. But if you want to say something about this aspect, yeah, yeah, yeah. Discuss, I just thought of something. I, I remembered uh, it was a Jordan Peterson podcast. Actually, he had an artist on. Uh, I think she did the work for his his latest book, and uh, she was describing. Yes. I can't remember the details, but this technique she uses to create the art, and it's very restrictive. It, it, um, but it makes her more creative because if you just look at the canvas and think I could use any kind of artistic technique to get an image on the canvas. Uh, and I could make any image, then you you don't even know where to begin. But if you think exactly. uh, this, there's this particular idea I'm trying to convey, I'm doing doing it for this chapter of the book or whatever, and I'm going to use this technique, so I'm very limited in how I can actually create the image. Uh, then the creativity is more. Um, so there's one interesting uh, thing uh, incident I'm aware of. We we had um, the single lady staying with us in our house for a little while. Uh, she was sort of like between jobs and different things, immigrating to New Zealand and waiting on visas and couldn't work at the time because of her visa situation. And she spent a couple of months working as a nanny for another family. And she's somebody who quite likes her space, quite likes to be independent. But while working in this house, just being a member of another family, helping with, with their young daughter, she was actually happy and satisfied and peaceful, even though she never would have imagined herself being happy in that situation. And now she's working a job and, and living in her own uh, apartment on her own again she still quite likes her own space and wouldn't choose to be a nanny in another house again but i just find it interesting like it's an interesting social experiment to see someone put in that mm. situation and fully satisfied true you know, that i was reading an article in new york times how uh, uh, in america there are many young people not just men but even women who are choosing to go to a Catholic church where they become uh, monk, priests or nuns. And it would seem completely radical to actually turn away and adopt a life of chastity or celibacy. But one reason is that it gives again some structure in life. Now, of course, one big problem with structure is that structure, if it is not guided with reason, then it can lead not only to irrationality, but it can also lead to fanaticism and that is one of the reasons why i say young people were attracted to extremist organizations like isn like isis and uh, islamic extremist organizations and others and because yeah, we it's like we want some sense of meaning and purpose in life and okay this is the structure this is what will give me meaning and purpose so if we envision this as a pendulum you know one extreme is to say that any system of meaning and purpose will be restrictive and therefore, we reject all systems of meaning and purpose. But the other extreme would be that to adopt a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, ad adopt some system of thought which gives meaning and purpose, and then at the end of it, one just holds on to it, not so much as a tool for living life meaningfully, but it becomes like a tool for just uh, becoming close-minded. So, uh, you know, it... Uh, any worldview that we have, it should actually our worldview should be able to explain the world to us, not that the worldview reduce the world so that it fits into that particular worldview. And this is where, again, if you want to come to John Peterson and Bhagavad Gita parallel, see the Bhagavad Gita is traditionally considered to be the word of God, of Krishna who has descended on the earth. And yet throughout the Gita, not once does Krishna tell Arjuna that I am God, therefore you have to accept what I am saying and believe it and obey me. That is never the mood of Krishna in the Gita. The, the Gita's worldview may be a little difficult for us to understand because it is so different from the worldview with, which we may have grown up with. But still it's clear, even a cursory reading of the Gita, that there is a lot of reasoning going on there. There are 17 places in the Gita where Arjuna asks questions. And the Gita is just a 700 verse book. So 17, questions, 17 places means almost every, every 50 verses, uh, Arjuna is asking a question. And every 50 verses, if, the, if you consider the Gita is spoken about one and a half hours, then that means after every four or five minutes, Arjuna is asking a question and Krishna is answering that question. Uh, so the point is that while we adopt some some means for structure and meaning in our life, it is important that we don't lose our reason. It, it, is, uh, it is important that we don't surrender or abandon our intellectual responsibility 
to seek to to use our rational faculty and that is seen in the gita and in the gita towards the end also it says that vimrishyate dasheshena yathechita guru they deliberate deeply and do what you desire do what you desire and this is the way i see in a parallel with jordan peterson also is that his earlier book maps of meaning is quite abstruse and not many people have read that book but in that book he says one of his motivations uh, in writing these books was to protect people or to immunize people to ideological indoctrination that he was concerned how the second world war occurred and how human beings ended up killing so many people so that is also the gita's mood that all the gita is teaching a particular world view it is not abandoning rationality in fact it is appealing to rationality so that would be the balance that in between the two extremes of the pendulum one extreme is that we reject all structures of meaning and purpose as as outdated or as restrictive or as tools of power or we just ab- accept some structure of meaning and power meaning and purpose by putting aside our rational thinking but rather we use our rationality to understand how this particular structure how this world view how so the structure i mean two things there's a world view of how we look at the world and then there is a way of living in the world how both of them how does this particular world view help me to live a more meaningful and purposeful life so that is what is uh, empowering otherwise both just accepting meaning accepting some structure uncritically or rejecting all structures both can be disempowering yeah the the reasoning aspect is very important for preventing people becoming fanatical in negative ways because i i'm a big believer in human nature and if people are given the right you know given the opportunity to think things through clearly that they'll for the most part act in in good ways it's when people are following blindly that you'll get difficulties so i think the you know dangerous religious fanaticism that causes violence in the world wouldn't happen if people were thinking critically yes true so this i said that i'll talk about three things the approach now coming to your point about privation which you had mentioned earlier one of the things is that with respect to meaning see what jordan peterson also the way he presents this is that when he talks about uh, how do you find meaning in life he doesn't say that you have to accept this particular text as authoritative or he says that basically take some take up some responsibility and meaning is proportional to responsibility to the extent we take up responsibility for something even if it be as something as small as just you know uh, cleaning our room creating order in our small corner of the world whatever we can hmm? that will give us a sense of meaning and especially if we're doing it as to, towards something outside of ourselves something bigger than ourselves then that gives us meaning so meaning is not just a result of some metaphysical insight that is a part of it but meaning also comes primarily from a sense of personal responsibility so this brings to second point that why are there so many mental health problems so the gita talks about a three level reality the physical level of reality which is where most of us function we have our bodies these are physical bodies so that the physical level of reality above that there is a subtle material level of reality which is which can we call as the mental level of reality and above it is the spiritual level of reality so physical mental and spiritual now among these three levels of reality which the gita posits there is a striking difference between say if you consider christian theology where there is just mind and matter this this subtle interface between the two of them that there is physical matter and we could say there is subtle matter or the mental matter the common phrase mind over matter that is used that is not correct according to the gita because mind is also a part of matter it's subtle something like if you consider a computer system there's a hardware software and user so the hardware is like the physical matter uh, then the software is like the mind 
and the user is consciousness user is the soul is the source of consciousness so within this three level reality what happens is uh, i hope this three level reality i have clarified yeah you that's, that's a really nice thing. analogy I, I like i like the way you put that okay so what happens is that within this three level reality mm, at the physical level distress is unavoidable it will come in some way or the other sooner or later the it may come in the form of the natural disasters it may come in terms of some wars it may come in terms of uh, its financial upheavals it may come in the form of disease so these distresses are unavoidable at the physical level now the real question is not that the distress that we can ever avoid distresses and this is where i was talking about the irony that to some extent the distresses at the physical level have been decreased with technological advancement and economic development and overall the journey from pre-modernity toward modernity in the western world not many people really worry about dying of starvation but so while the at the physical level distresses have decreased before this current pan, recent pandemic and the ukraine russia war actually from the second world war onwards the world did enjoy a relatively a relatively peaceful period for 6 7 seven decades so in spite of that uh, there is uh, uh, there is a on the physical level we have been able to decrease the distresses but still the mental level it is that distresses have increased and that is the that is where the idea of meaning through responsibility comes in the point is that it's not the distress that troubles us it is more that meaningless distress that troubles us okay i can take up trouble but what is the point of taking up this trouble if there is no point in taking up the trouble then even the smallest of troubles can become unbearable if i find that my say somebody may be living in an air conditioned room very comfortable and still they may find that uh, oh you know this this the room is too crowded or my food is not good or this or that but somebody might be going on some humanitarian work to some distant country where there is danger constantly and yeah and they may have no certainty about food or even their survival but they are going they have some meaning and purpose and they embrace that they embrace that and they look forward to it so so the at the physical level distress is unavoidable but how we process that distress depends on the kind of world view we have in our mind the 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 how we have connected with the world how we have create what is our what is it that gives us sense of meaning and purpose and if that is lacking then even the smallest of distresses become unbearable so again this is where we could say there is a significant parallel between jordan peterson and uh, the bhagavad gita's approach now P- jordan peterson is quite candid in telling that life is tough there is distress in the world and distress is going to get us all sooner or later and the bhagavad gita uses the word dukkhalaya dukkhalaya literally means the place of distress dukkha is distress many the viewer viewers may be familiar with the buddhist concept of dukkha that's a variant of the sanskrit dukkha but say both mean distress alaya is the place now it's interesting when it says this uh, that in this world is a place of distress is, is are we being pessimistic about it but it's not so much pessimistic as realistic it is setting a baseline expectation just like uh, there is in india a mountain mountain range in the north which is called the himalaya now himalaya alaya is again the abode or place hima is snow so himalaya is the place of snow now if somebody goes to the himalayas it's going to be cold 
there is no denying that the one has to accept that and live with that but does that mean that the only thing that is going to be there is cold no not necessarily now there could be stunning sights of beauty there could be glorious achievements on uh, climbing up and reach, uh, reaching some mountain peaks like the everest there could be rare life forms to be seen there are many other things which could be quite uh, fulfilling even thrilling which are there in the himalayas but one can pr progress toward looking at all those things only when one has accepted and reconciled with the reality that this is going to be extremely cold if one is constantly resenting why is this so cold why is this so cold then that resentment itself will prevent one from looking for at anything else from even perceiving the beauty that is there in the himalayas so similarly when the gita says this world is dukhale or jordan peterson that life is distress life is distressful this is meant to set our baseline expect expectation of what life in the world is likely to be now after that yeah distress is unavoidable but within after accepting that distress how can we look forward to see meaning to see beauty and to find fulfillment in the world and that is what both the gita and uh, that is also the gita's approach so in the if you look at the ethical context of the gita arjuna is the warrior you know is your namesake so he he is facing a heart wrenching dilemma where he has to fight against those who are very very dear to him without going into the specifics of the ethics what the gita, the gita doesn't offer him any circumstantial resolution you know this is why you have to fight against this this is why you have to fight against this he says no folk it is a very painful situation you are in but focus on what is your responsibility and in in focusing on his responsibility arjuna is able to find meaning arjuna is able to find find purpose and he becomes enlivened so so in that sense accepting distress as a baseline reality and then putting aside the resentment that might otherwise come and then looking okay how can i how can i take up responsibility that will lead to a sense of meaning and purpose does that make sense overall yeah those are nice points uh, it reminds me of one jordan peterson quote where he said something like uh if you if you're trying to use happiness as your anchor in life that's very shallow mooring and a storm any storm that comes along will destroy you it's like an analogy to a boat whose yes. anchor is not properly situated uh but if if you if your anchor is is not happiness but meaning purpose responsibility then if a storm comes along it you can still hold on to that uh victor frankel made the same point in another way when he observed uh that the people who were surviving past christmas in the concentration camps were those people who were asking the question what have i got to offer life because he observed that there are a high number of people died around christmas time in the concentration camps in world war 2 and he attributed this to th they were the people who were asking what has life got for me i know i'll be home by christmas christmas rolls around and they're not home the thing they were looking forward to didn't come and now they've got nothing to look forward to their meaning that their anchor the thing they were anchored to is now gone yeah exactly you know pleasure is to trivial a purpose to sustain us through life's challenges it it is too fragile too trivial because it will not it will work what happen two problems can come up one is that the pleasure may go away because of uh, life's challenges and second is that even if that pleasure is there after some time due to the what is called the law of diminishing returns that same thing may not feel that enjoyable so that's why pleasure is both too trivial and too fragile a purpose and this is where the gita talks about something uh, about detachment and one of the well known verses of the gita is karmanne vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana it's 247 that you have a right to do your work but do not be attached to the results of the work and this can seem quite counterintuitive 
because for many people the idea is when you work you envision the results and try to as clear a vision you have of the results then you'll be motivated to work and um, and in fact jordan peterson also talks about this envision where your life will be 3 years from now you know if you try to become the try to develop all your good habits where you could be and if you let your work, bad habits grow where you will end up so envision that so this might seem counterintuitive or count, count, not this counter, counterintuitive but also contrary to today's mainstream understanding but actually the gita is talking about something very subtle so if we consider this is the action if we okay put it this way this is the action Mm-hmm. the gita differentiates between goals and results goals are what we set before we do the work results are what we get after we do the work so the gita is not saying don't set goals in fact after the gita is spoken arjun uh, in the subsequent challenges that he faces in the subsequent uh, confrontation that he has to go through he sets goals on a daily basis this is what i'm going to do this is what i'm going to do today so the gita is not against setting goals it is against being attached to results now why is the difference what is the difference between the two because the as is rightly pointed out goals can give us a sense of inspiration motivation they can energize us but if that is all that we are seeking through what we are doing if a student sets a goal no i want to get into this say ivy league university or i want to get into this particular career i want to get into this particular job if that is the sole thing that is motivating them and if somehow because of some reason that doesn't work out then what will happen is they just feel completely disoriented what am i to do with my life my life is a failure so the same goals which can actually motivate us to work hard they can also demotivate us if they don't work out and that is why now what, what is our idea for most people the idea is if i achieve my goal there will be pleasure and if i get this degree from this university i'll be i there's so much prestige or there is so much uh, i so much as a lucrative career i can have or this 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 so that's all those are sources of pleasure but the idea is results means that in setting goals in pursuing goals we may or may not bring about changes in the outer world but we will bring about changes in our inner world we will transform ourselves we will become better and the fixation with outer results can sometimes blind us to the inner results that are coming blind us to the transformation and elevation of our consciousness that is happening so so that inner change is the central message of the gita and uh, how am i connecting this is the point of pleasure being too fra- fragile or trivial because if we are motivated solely by the pleasure of attaining an outer goal then that can demotivate us when the pleasure doesn't come up but if we have a higher purpose beyond pleasure so sometimes i differentiate between like some people say i want to make a difference in the world so i uh, the i dif- i sort of differentiate between making a difference and making a contribution not all of us can make a difference or not all of us may be able to see the difference that we are making there are movies like it's a wonderful life where this person about is about to die and then he comes back and he's shown what all the difference he has made in in the lives of others but most of us live in such a vast and complicated world that the uh, the difference we are making may not be visible to us but what can you always say is am i making a contribution am i doing something worthwhile am i contributing toward making a difference that we can surely do and in that sense the gita's teaching of detachment uh, and the jordan peterson's point a point of you know not making pleasure the purpose of life those two can be are remarkably similar so there was a jordan peterson clip i actually have queued up which is on this topic where he explains that there's di- the neuro- neurological pathways that are activated when we are presented with difficulty are very different from the neurological pathways that go on when we choose to f- to engage the difficulty to take on the austerity to take up the challenge
The people who pick up the stressor voluntarily, voluntarily use a whole different psychophysiological system to deal with it. They use the system that's associated with approach and challenge, and not the system that's associated with defensive aggression and withdrawal. And the system that is associated with challenge is much more associated with positive emotion, and much less associated with negative emotion. It's also much less hard on you, because the, the defensive posturing system, the prey animal system, man, when that thing kicks in, it's all systems are go for you you know your the gas is pushed down to the or the pedals pushed down to the metal and the brakes are on you're using future resources that you could be storing for future time right now in the present to ready yourself for emergency so there's 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 nothing simple or trivial at all about the idea of being called to move forthrightly forward into the strange and the unknown and there's a real adventure that's associated with that, right? So that's an exciting thing, which is part of the reason why people travel. And then also to see yourself as the sort of creature that can do that, is willing to do that on a habitual basis, is also the right kind of tonic for, I hate this word, for your self-esteem. You know, because the self-esteem has nothing to do with feeling good about yourself. As, as I already mentioned, there isn't necessarily a reason why, a priori, you should just feel good about yourself. But if you can view yourself acting in a courageous and forthright manner, and encountering the world, and trying to improve your lot, and, and, and taking risks, you know, in a non-naive way, well, then you have something that you can comfort yourself with at night when you're wondering what the whole damn point of, is, uh, of your futile and miserable life. And so... And that's necessary because it's often the case that you wake up at four in the morning, or at least sometimes the case that you wake up at four in the morning when things haven't been going that well, and wonder just what the hell the point is of your futile and miserable life. You have to have some. So this is, I'd like to introduce this. In the Gita, there is a concept of three modes. And it's significant that, while Jordan Peterson has, is also exploring the Islamic tradition now, He's also, he studied the Judeo-Christian tradition quite a bit. But it seems that he has not encountered the uh, the Vedic tradition much or the concept of the gunas from the Bhagavad Gita. So I would like to talk about that. There are three gunas which the Gita talks about, three modes. So the modes, the, they are basically, they can be seen as two things. One is they are like subtle ropes that bind us to, that bind, that link consciousness with matter that link consciousness with matter and so they they impel us to think in particular ways act in particular ways i talk about it in the three p's you know how we perceive how we process and what we pursue so our perceiving processing and pursuing all these are shaped by the modes so there is sattva rajas and tamas sattva can roughly be translated as goodness or clarity rajas can be translated as passion or hyperactivity and tamas is ignorance or lethargy so these three are ways in which uh, we look at the world and we approach the world and of course these three can be also considered to be like colors and these three colors can combine together to give many many different uh, combinations and that's why we have such a wide variety of personalities wide variety of characteristics in human beings. So going back to the earlier three level model, the physical, mental and spiritual. So the modes color both physical and mental reality. They color the way we perceive reality and they color the reality out there. So, so to the extent, now in terms of pleasure and purpose, this dynamic if you talk about it, in the mode of ignorance, when a person is very much influenced by tamas that person will pursue pleasure without caring at all for purpose and after some time they start pursuing the activity that gives pleasure even if it stops giving pleasure what i mean by this is let's say somebody becomes addicted now you say initially somebody might drink because it makes them feel good it helps them to go high if they do drugs or even say uh, have a lot of sur TV surfing or uh, TV watching or internet surfing but after some time the consciousness starts diminishing and then they do that surfing not so much because it gives pleasure 
but rather it it removes the deadening of life it actually offers some kind of escape way from the emptiness or the distress of life so it's not so much a means to go high as it is a means to to avoid going down so in the more when somebody is affected by tamas by the mode of ignorance it is pursuing pleasure not only at the cost of purpose but pursuing pleasure even at the cost of pleasure that means somebody watches tv not because watching tv is enjoyable but because not watching tv makes them feel so empty and i have to do something so i'm not condemning watching tv but i'm talking about compulsion of where tv watching becomes a compulsion or net surfing becomes a compulsion now in the mode of passion there is a tension between pleasure and purpose there are times in the mode of indrajas a person f- will for some future pleasure uh, give up present pleasure hmm? uh, athletes may regulate their diet and follow a very strict regimen of exercise so that they can achieve a trophy they can achieve some distinction mm-hmm. people uh, so what happens over here is that there is a subordinate of pleasure pleasure there is a subordination of pleasure for the sake of purpose but that purpose may not for many people be very deep so for example somebody may just do some do a lot of workouts in now in the west yoga is becoming very popular and in one sense it's good now yoga originally was meant for a spiritual development now yoga is being practiced so that just people can have fit and attractive bodies so that they can they can be more sexually attractive that's not for everyone but for a significant number of people so what is happening is there is purpose but it's not a much higher purpose it's also a purpose largely at the physical level so there is a tension between pleasure and purpose and the mode of rajas in rajoguna and if somebody in sattva guna the mode of goodness then there is the pursuit of purpose even if it is at the cost of pleasure so what you, in this particular code jordan person is talking about is that he says you wake up and you think what is the point of our existence so so that comes up, that is indicative of a person who has sunk very deeply into into tamas where one is just going along mechanically doing the things which which promised pleasure in the past even if they are not giving any pleasure now is continue doing that and continuing with it till it just becomes a default behavior which is mindless and joyless and somehow something has to break us out of it jolt us out of it does that make sense um yeah i just had a thought i can't remember what it was um but that is making sense i remember now what i was going to say um jordan peterson has commented that uh like a lot of psychology they study what happens when people go wrong when when people have mental illness and they're studying this is mental illness let's figure out how to fix it uh i think other psychologists have commented on this too but what's really amazing is that anybody ever is mentally well <laughs> or stable the amazing thing is people who are doing well and, and that's what we should, we should be studying and figuring out based on successful people happy people well adjusted people what it is that 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 is the magic behind succeeding and finding happiness and satisfaction um do you want to comment okay yeah that's a good point that uh, overall there is something deep within the human uh, with, within the human person which actually strives for for some kind of meaning for some kind of purpose to to bring order out of the chaos in many ways we can say that this is what points to the transcendence what the spark of the divine what is what john peterson also refers to within people Now, if we consider from a biological perspective this idea of meaning and purpose is not seen so in non human species so it is that that the struggle for existence struggle for survival procreation all that that is those basic bodily drives are there in all species 
but if we consider it is humans who who want some meaning who want some structure order in their lives and then the problem that comes up is that when that order is not available what do we do then that is where we may sink into chaos we can sink into distress and there is a lot to be distressed about in the world one of the challenges which we humans face as compared to other other living beings on the on our planet is that we can to some extent foresee the future so for example with respect to the environment there are so many species living on the planet but they they are not aware of climate change and they don't feel apprehensive or desperate about it we human beings we can perceive that these problems are coming that we might be on the verge of severe environmental problems catastrophes also and then that so not only can we ex, not only do we experience the distresses that we are going through right now but we can also perceive the distresses that are going to come upon us in the future mm -hmm. and that can actually make us miserable there are several existentialist philosophers who ended up be suffering from great uh, distress chronic depression alberto camus he said that the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow because there is so much distress which we all go through sooner or later and there is so much distress that we can perceive in our future now some of us may close our eyes and not think about it but and it is difficult to keep our eyes closed now with the inter with the connection connectedness that we are having through the internet and social media we can have this dis distresses from all over the world uh, on our phones either images the statistics the gory details we can have all of them and it is so easy to sink into despair and to give up but there is something within within the human spirit that from which hope springs eternal as it is said so that actually points to the transcendence within us so from the sheer facts of the world it is easy to become pessimistic from our capacity to pursue the future realities of what we are going to face in the world it's even more likely to become more depressed and if you are not to become depressed like that the only way is if we ha we have something within us which is not biologically reducible which is not materially destructible and it is attaining that realizing that which gives our striving some meaning some purpose so the eternal the it not just the divinity jordan peterson often talks about the divine divine spark that is at the core of us but the gita focuses not just on the divinity of that spark but also the indestructibility of that spark that there is a core within all of us which is not biologically reducible which is not a psychologically uh, reducible which goes beyond yes biology can give us a lot of insights into how our brain works psychology can give us a lot of insight into how our mind works but beyond our brains and beyond our minds there is something to us which is the foundation of our resilience and the more we can situate ourselves in that the greater will be our resilience in facing life's challenges and the whole purpose of the gita is to take our self understanding towards that spiritual ground of our being that which the gita calls as the atma that is the source of consciousness that is that is beyond our biology beyond our psychology and it is that which will uh, which when arjuna understands in the gita that becomes the source of his rejuvenation the source of his resilience so so that is the now jordan peterson doesn't specifically talk about the indestructibility of our spirit from whatever i have seen he does talk about he does talk, he, he uses a lot of biological and psychological insights but then he also acknowledges that no matter how much we analyze with biology and psychology there is something 
which is beyond it all. There is something to us that is beyond it all. Now, what that something is is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, back on that point of despair, and uh, also this is, ties into your point about structure. Uh, part of despair can can be not knowing how we plug into things, not having that structure, seeing problems in the world, but not knowing what we can do about it. Whereas in a more traditional society, we we might be aware of despair, but we wouldn't. Well, one thing is we wouldn't have been aware of despair on a global scale. Um, we would have just known our you know our local village. There might have been homeless people, people with illness, single moms, orphans, but it's just a few people in a little village. So these people we can have compassion for, but when it's millions of people in Africa, millions of people in Ukraine, it becomes overwhelming for us to think, oh my God, so much suffering on such a large scale and I'm just one person. How can I possibly make any difference? But when it's more local, small things, and there's a structure where I know this is my dharma, this is how I plug in, I have these kids to look after, or that this wife to care for, these grandparents to care for, this is my job, I, I need these to take care of these things, and that's my dharma. All these other problems, they're there, but it's outside of my sphere of influence. I can r- relax about those. It's, it's, it's someone else's problem to worry about. True. You know, this is, again, the if you go back to the framework of the three modes, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, in, in the mode of Tamas ignorance, we underestimate our capacity to make any contribution or difference. Oh, the world is a terrible place. People are corrupt. And nothing is going to change. That is a very toxic mentality to have. We underestimating our capacity is toxic, but we overestimating our capacity can also be toxic in a different way. And that is the characteristic of Rajas. So, so what sometimes Jordan Peterson condemns is some activists who believe that they just read one book and they think they know what is the problem in the world and this, you just fix this and every, all the problems in the world will be fixed. So I would say that Tamas will be in terms of this categorization. It is just nihilism or existential despair and hopelessness in terms of this passion would be uh, intense ideological infatuation where somebody thinks, you know, if this problem is fixed, all the problems will be solved in the world. And the only problem in the world is say that there is discrimination among the genders. Only problem in the world is that there is racial discrimination. The only problem in the world is that there is environmental disaster about to happen. And uh, so we reduce the world to one problem and we overestimate our capacity to change things. That is capable of rajas. That that is the characteristic of rajas. Right. And And and, in sattva... And while doing that, we railroad a whole lot of other things and and create a whole lot of other problems. Uh, I've heard Christians talk about this, like, you know, the the old idea you shouldn't worship false idols. One way I've heard it described, which makes a lot of sense to me, is when you take something like a little problem in the world and you think this is the only thing we need to fix, you're creating an idol out of that thing. And instead of giving importance to God, you're giving importance to fixing whatever problem is you, you've, you've chosen to fix your mind. I'll, I'll refrain from naming something so I don't offend anybody. Um, but <laughs> you've made this your thing that, that, and you sideline everything else. And while you're sidelining everything else, you create a lot of problems because c- you're not giving other issues the proper d- due importance. Like uh, Ryan Lomberg, Jordan Peterson's had on, and he, he talks about uh, how... Sure, the, the climate change is an issue. We're, we're doing bad things to the climate, but the amount of energy we're spending worrying about climate change, if we spent that energy on other issues, we could actually have a far more beneficial impact with the same amount of energy. It's about uh, having measured responses. I, I found your, your point about the three gunas interesting because it, it, there's often a little... Uh, simplistic explanations given for the gunas and different other aspects of the philosophy like the typical one is mode of ignorance is suffering now and suffering later mode of passion is um is is it ple- pleasure now and suffering later and the mode of pa- mode yes. of goodness is suffering now and pleasure later but uh you know so the, the, the perhaps that should be commented on briefly and i'll give you a moment to do that but the the one you just gave there is mode of ignorance is is thinking I can't have any impact on the world. So you're underestimating your abilities. Mode of passion is overestimating your abilities, thinking I can do all these things. I can fix all these problems. Everyone just needs to listen to me and everything will be fine. Or I just need to get up and do all this hard work and then everything will be fine. And mode of goodness would be understanding 
what things are within your sphere of influence, understanding your capacity, you know, just ac- having accurate views on these things and consequently acting in a balanced, measured, mature way. Mm, yes. See, the mode of the three modes, there are, they're subtle and complex concepts. So it's, a, it's easy to reduce them to just one particular frame of analysis. And that is, uh, I think that is a problem where we consider the overall that uh, yes that is also one way of distress in the beginning and distress in uh, distress all the time that is one way of looking at the modes but and the krishna does mention that in the bhagavad gita uh, towards 18 chapter end but that is not the only characteristic of the modes now, if something is just solely distressful why would anyone do it at all isn't it now what happens is for the person going through it, for the person in that mode, it doesn't seem distressful. Like somebody is an alcoholic and they drink a lot and then they throw up and then they make a embarrass themselves. An objective observer may say, you know, why are you subjecting yourself to that distress? But for that person, it doesn't seem distressful. So there is a subjective and objective component to the modes that subjectively, when we are under that mode, we don't really see, we don't, when we are under the, uh, under the influence of that particular guna, we don't really see how it is affecting our perceiving, pursuing, processing. We just go along with it thinking this is the right way. A person who is, uh, who is in tamoguna and who is just addicted to something, you know, it's, it's that they feel this is the only way I can cope with life's problems. And addiction can be, I don't want to reduce addiction simplest, simplistically to just a failure of willpower. It can also be a disease where uh, multiple levels of intervention may be required. But the point I'm making is that the gunas are complex concepts. And especially when Krishna talks in the 18th chapter earlier, so the verses you quoted were 18, 37, 38, 39. But I was referring a little earlier to 18, 20, 23 to 27 where Krishna talks about work in the three modes and workers in the three modes. So there, he ta- there, from there, we can infer this point of estimating our capacity properly. So overestimating our capacity can be a big problem. And in my understanding, uh, stress is a result of, uh, is a result of this overestimating. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do everything. And then actually Rajas and Tamas are quite closely related that uh, that we overestimate our capacity and then when we find things are not working we just descend into descend into complete uh, disorder and distress is there a, so a merry-go-round between the two point. you go from one and then to the other on a cycle between yeah. passion and what, what is that called ferris wheel uh, what is that personality disorder oh, manic bi- depressive yeah uh, bipolar bipolar manic depressive yeah we could use different words for it but the idea is that mm, where these two one can just go up and down them very rapidly and it can be a serious problem. So yes, I agree fully that uh, the modes have a lot of layers in them and the modes can offer us many different perspectives for making better sense of how things happen in the world. We, we should probably say we're not boiling down uh, a psych- psychological disorder to the gunas. <laughs> We're just giving a comparison. You know, this is an interesting. That's an interesting point you may have brought up. It is good that you brought it up. See, uh, there is uh, with respect to the, the the Bhagavad Gita talks about the gunas, and these are discussed much more in the Sankhya. Sankhya is a system of thought. So there is this question of: Do the gunas control us, or do we control the gunas? And the understanding is that it's both ways is that the gunas control us in some ways and there are some ways in which we can control the gunas. Now, where exactly the interface comes, that is something which is uh, which is something which is not so easy to understand. So, I am talking about this is that that when somebody is suffering from some problems, now whether they are addictions or they are psychological problems, now at one level we can say it is uh, it will be associated with tamoguna. But what does it mean? 
does it simply mean that that person has to have the will power and they will be able to come out of it no sometimes coming out of tamoguna will require much more than individual will power it may require that that person has to relocate to some place which is substantially in sattva and when they they are in, they relocated to that place that is where they will be able to draw on those outer resources and then come towards sattva so one of my favorite examples which i use for how things can become compulsive is if you now we have a a a hill where snow has fallen and it's all covered with snow and on the top there is somebody form the tiny snow pebble now it's not even a snowball it's a snow pebble at that point now a person could just kick it with their toe and it'll crack apart but as it starts coming down 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 it acquires mass and it acquires momentum from a snow pebble it can become a snowball from a snowball it can become a snow boulder and when it is become a snow boulder at that time it can knock over completely a fully grown person so with respect to compulsive behaviors they may all they may all start as a snow pebble but they can grow into not not just snowballs but snow boulders and so for somebody who might be very much say somebody gets into drugs and they get out of it and somebody else gets into drugs and they find it very difficult to get out of it so is it that the first person has greater will power and the second person has lesser will power not necessarily for the first person they might have got into drugs but it might just have been at the snow pebble level and is click it and the snow pebble breaks apart uh, flick it and the snow pebble breaks apart but for somebody else it might have gone to the snow boulder level and no matter what they do if a boulder is just charging down from on the slope of a hill the you know, person cannot stop it so so the point i'm making is that even if somebody equate even if we say equate psychological problems with the tamoguna coming out of tamoguna may be a very different process for different people and that's why individually analyzing a person's situation and then finding out the appropriate process for dealing with it is important in the bhakti tradition there is of course the emphasis on will power and the determination but there are two factors you're talking about in the bhakti tradition one is individual determination and the second is you could say spiritual association that determination and association both are essential if there's only one of these it's not sustainable what will happen is it may a person may not be able to continue on and avoid the relapse into their previous kinds of behavior did i address your point um yeah yeah i i i was just making a point about how we we don't want to say that we're giving an assessment of a particular mental illness and saying it's caused by this cuz these these things are very complex and of so course. on um but th- there was an interesting point about the the boulder and th- th- how getting a problem early before it runs away from you is important like with anger management say or uh, other things where people in the heat of the moment uh can do things they would not otherwise Uh, such as take certain kinds of intoxication and continue to take more uh, and make other choices that asking asking how to make the right decision in that moment is the wrong question because once you're in that situation it's already too late i think this was a point mahatma prabhu makes i've heard it from him uh yeah it, 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 it's yes. it's a whole state of consciousness that you cultivate the rest of the time uh that affects whether or not you ever end up in that situation where you're out of control or whether you act and you know, make that the a better choice in that situation um and also i th- with, with regard to uh drug problems uh and you know ad- addiction and so on uh well wh- one thing to say is uh, people who work with people with addictions they'll comment that i've never seen an addict that wasn't traumatized as a child you'll see people who suffered trauma as a child who aren't drug addicts but you'll never see a drug addict who wasn't traumatized and the reason people take the drugs is because it makes their pain go away and uh this this ties in nicely with a point jordan peterson often makes with uh, he's he's bringing up ancient 
allegory of dragons. Uh, but he does a very good job of it where the, the dragon which you're facing is always better than the dragon which you're running from. There's something about avoiding a problem and running away from it, trying to make the pain going away that makes it seem that much more worse. It's like this cloud that hangs over you and every time you see a little reminder of it, you imagine it being worse than it actually is. But if you actually turn around and face the dragon, if, if you embrace the difficulty, like that clip I played earlier where Jordan Peterson exclaimed that the neurological systems which are activated when you are faced with difficulty but are avoiding it, you go into prey mode. Uh, you, you, you become like a, a victim running away from a problem. Whereas when you stand up and face the problems, it's completely different neurological systems and your capacity to deal with it is greatly enhanced. Um, so the people who overcome the addictions, that it could be a result of they're actually standing up and facing their difficulties rather than trying to make the pain go away. But also, I think past life is another explanation that some people, they, they, they have more mental fortitude coming from advances in consciousness they've made over previous lifetimes, whereas another person is bringing... Anartas, uh, bad qualities in the heart, uh, negative impressions, negative samskaras with them yeah. from previous lives. So other people have actually done a lot of the internal work to make it so that they could slip into a drug problem and then slip out of it. Whereas the person who slips into the drug problem and has a really difficult time getting out of it uh, likely hasn't done that hard work yet and, and they're doing it fresh. Agreed fully. You know, this is where, again, the idea of and the Atma that is, it can actually extend, uh, deepen one's understanding of one's psychology also. So among these three levels of reality, the physical, the biological, the psychological, and the spiritual. Although the Atma itself is spiritual, but then the Atma also reincarnates. And so when you talk about psychology, uh, it is not just the scars, the traumas that we may have endured in our childhood. Hmm? in this life it could also be in previous life previous lives in fact now i would like to offer a couple of caveats over here before i take this point forward the first is that there is the always the possibility of getting caught in the past not the possibility i would say the danger that that okay what exactly from the past caused this problem and what caused that problem and what caused that problem it can be helpful to look at the past and learn from the past. But it also has to be done carefully. I think Jordan Peterson also makes this point in his uh, 12 rules that you know, we can never get a exhaustive knowledge of the past. Because say somebody somebody goes through some trauma, you know, say so, so somebody is in a relationship and they have a painful breakup. Now, both these people will have very different, significantly different versions of what actually happened. And what caused the breakup? Now, the point of looking at the past is not so much to determine exactly what actually happened. Yes, to some extent, we want to understand as objectively as possible what happened. But more important than simply getting the facts right is getting the values right. That means, okay, what can I learn from what happened so that I can prevent the mistakes, similar mistakes from happening in in the future for me. So the one of the problems when so these gunas three modes, they affect everything and they affect even the way we look at our past. So if somebody is prominently in tamoguna, in the more in the mode of ignorance, then they will look at the past and they get lost in the past. Like being subjected to self-pity and lamentation and resentment and moroseness. And for them, it may be best told that we just don't think about the past now. Let the dead past bury its dead. Move on. One needs at least some level of a sattva guna, mode of goodness by which, okay, I can observe my past. But at the same time, I know, I'm aware that I am separate from the past that I have a distinct identity separate from what happened, what transpired, even what I was subjected to. To the extent we can distance ourselves, uh, we can be objective observers. And then we can learn what is to be learned. 
so the same applies to the study of history now if we see that there is to some extent uh, uh what 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 would the word for it there is some some kind of some people claim at uh, especially the extreme left they say they look at the entire history of humanity as how people were wrong how this person the abraham lincoln has been cancelled in parts of america why because he didn't act strongly enough against slavery or fast enough against slavery well okay that may be true from but, but he did what he could in his times so my point i'm making is that if we if we don't have the right framework when looking at the past we will end up either losing ourselves in the past or continuing to fight battles from the past which really are not meant to be fought in the present it's like we are superimposing present values on the past so if if the if say the chaitanya charana day of 15 made some mistake and chaitanya charana day of 45 you understands okay that was a mistake so when i'm looking back at it i shouldn't be beating myself up for what i did at that time okay i learned from it that was the time that was what i was and that is what i did let me learn from it and move forward so if we don't do that then it will not be easy for us to survive so yes learn from history learn from the past uh, but don't get caught in it and the bhagavad gita's approach is very striking over here if we consider the point that krishna is is divinity you now he is omniscient yet there is very little analysis of the past in the bhagavad gita krishna gives the objective information that you know we are eternal beings who are transmigrating but it doesn't go too much into uh, for arjuna why exactly are you facing this war so what what karma had you done in the past because of which now you had to fight with your relatives what karma had they done in the past because of which now they have they have to they are fighting on the wrong side so uh, the bhagavad gita does not go into that kind of analysis so much even the bhagavad gita which is the in the mahabharat which is the larger book of which the gita is a part there also it is not so emphatic it is the past life explanations are given but they are not the prominent explanation so why is that because the past is somewhere where we can easily get lost and it requires a it requires a strong grounding in sattva to ensure that we get we learn from the past and we don't get lost in the past this reminds me of a nice point mahatma prabhu makes which is uh when we when we do something wrong uh we we need to have the right amount of i guess beating ourselves up over it we, if we, if we beat ourselves up over it too much we'll get depressed and we won't be able to move forward if we don't beat ourselves up at all we're just going to continue to make the same mistake but if we have the right amount of feeling uh, feeling uncomfortable about it then we'll be motivated to do better next time uh and also uh, and the point you're making about dwelling on the past too much is a problem uh i think like philosophically for answering the problem of evil and also for uh taking personal responsibility for what happens to us in life we need to understand i've lived before i've accrued karma and i'm re- i'm receiving the results of my past actions now but we don't need to know any any more details than that necessarily unless they come up there may be some reason in some cases where some knowing some details is useful but overall in 99.99 and several more nights of cases we we don't need to know any more than that like uh one of my favorite verses from bhagavatam and prabhupad commented on this verse saying it should be the anthem for all devotees shrimad bhagavatam 10.14.8 uh brahma is, is offering prayers to krishna he's saying my dear lord one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy so there's three things that are given here that we should do and i i think it's like a kind of serenity prayer but a, a kind of mindset which both gives us a really healthy mentality and if you accept the authority of bhagavatam it gets, it's the ticket out of here the the ticket to god's mercy to god's shelter is we have to be expecting god's mercy so of course we we can't overcome our problems we've got so many weaknesses and so on but we're making some effort and without god helping us we're hopeless right so we should expect that god's going to pick up the slack that this is something that all devotees should do expect that god's going to give us some mercy uh all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds 
Um, so that's another important thing. So understanding whatever bad things happen to me, whatever good things happen to me, that's reactions, or I guess the bad things in this case, uh, suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds. That those are those are caused by actions I've done in the past. Uh, so I and I in some way deserve them. There's no reason for me to be bitter or resentful or blame or say I'm a victim, blame it on anything else. I take responsibility for the things that happened to me in life. Uh, and this this gives us a healthy mindset and it solves our problems. And then the other thing is all the while offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and body. Uh, there's a lot of Christian values in there too. I, th I think Jordan Peterson would find this verse very interesting. True. You know, there are two things over here. Uh, what you said is that the way of the analysis of karma what has happened, unfortunately, is that the Vedic tradition has not been adequately explained from within its own lived framework. That means the Vedic tradition has been explained either by, by Western academic scholars whose interest was primarily clinical, not that of uh, somebody who wanted to adopt like internal experiencer kind of thing or it was explained by by uh, christian scholars who were often associated with the colonial purposes of the british government so what has happened is while karma is itself a very empowering uh, concept for us to move ahead in life sometimes this idea of karma that i have done something in my past and because of which i am facing some situations this is sometimes misunderstood and sometimes unfortunately misapplied to pile guilt on people more. So some people argue that uh, that if somebody is suffering and uh, on top of them you tell them this is because of something which you have done, won't it make things worse and won't it make others heartless? See somebody is born terribly sick uh, with, with some terrible sickness somebody living in acute poverty, somebody has their entire family killed in an accident, and at that time you tell them it's their own karma. Isn't it cruel? Well, it can be. So this is where my understanding is, if we are only teaching philosophy without understanding the psychology, then we will run into a lot of trouble we will ourselves misapply and we will misrepresent the philosophy. So there is the philosophy. Philosophy is, we could say, the law of truth, philis philosophos. Psychology is the understanding of human behavior, human mind, human emotions. So there has to be a very careful understanding of how philosophy and psychology are going to interact. And uh, let me explain with respect to karma what this can mean that say if there's a child in a family and the family family is the parents are separating now it is vital for whoever is counseling that child to tell that child that you know your father or your, if your father is um i've lost you can you hear me oh you back you know? Okay, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So the last thing I heard is you were saying um, it's important that they tell the child whose parents have just split up. The parents are split up not because of that. It's not because of you that the parents are splitting up. Hmm? That the ch parent, the children should not carry an unnecessary guilt. Can you hear now? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. So the point I was making is that. The, the idea of karma, it has to be applied carefully. Hmm? That a child should not be told that if your parents are splitting, that is because of something you have done. That is That could be very damaging for the child. Child will be burdened with unnecessary guilt. So, so the point I'm making here over here is that while there is an implicit understanding that what the distresses we face they are due to something we have done in the past. But simultaneously, there is an acknowledgement. There is a difference between, say, immediate causes for which we are responsible, for which society should hold us responsible, 
and remote causes for which we cannot be held responsible that means if say somebody somebody meets with an accident hmm, that was because somebody else was driving drunk hmm, uh, and they hit this person now should the victim consider it was because of my own karma that this happened yes yes no doubt but does that mean that that other person should not be held responsible the other person should be hey you know this is just the way it is you get away with it is no so okay let me try to explain in another way the gita talks about three levels of causation there is an immediate cause there is a remote cause and there is ultimate cause so the so the uh, the let me explain this in terms of say somebody is is on a is in a boat not a very sturdy boat in a boat in a vast ocean and uh, maybe they may move very uh, not even a boat they may like a canoe and if they move suddenly it may just capsize uh, water may come in and they may be they may be endangering themselves so that person has to be very very careful that they row properly mm-hmm. so their rowing properly is their responsibility but if suddenly they are encountering giant waves hmm? maybe a tsunami comes over there now you cannot hold that person responsible for the tsunami at that point okay this is something we can't change accept it so and then ultimately so when a person is facing danger in the in the ocean that danger we could say it has three levels of causes one is maybe you are rowing carelessly and that's why this uh, canoe is so unstable that's one the second could be you uh, that we are encountering stormy waves now mm? the ocean in this part is turbulent the third is that you we are in the ocean itself as long as we are in the ocean there is going to be danger so come out of the ocean the danger will go away so similarly there are three levels that there are sometimes problems which come due to immediate causes and they need to be fixed at the immediate level just like right now when we were having this discussion suddenly the audio went off now at this point if you or i say you know okay it's because of our karma this didn't work and maybe god has some plan for this okay that may be true but let's try to fix things right now so so the idea of karma is not meant to take away our sense of immediate responsibilities okay this situation can i tackle it right now with my capacities i should tackle it but sometimes it's just not possible to tackle it so it is it is not so much to abandon our immediate responsibilities that the idea of karma is drawn upon it is more to accept the inevitability of certain immediate situations so if i am not doing my job well and that's why i'm getting fired or i'm in the danger of getting fired i can't think it's because of my past karma it's what is my present karma right now how can i do my job better that's important hmm? if somebody is having problems in their family life and that time they start thinking that oh this grahastha as in the sometimes this bhagavatam philosophy is misunderstood oh grahastha ashram is itself a place of misery well that is not the right framework at that time okay what can i do to improve things but sometimes despite our best efforts things may go wrong then to accept the inevitability of immediate situations we talk about karma and ultimately third point you're talking about god's grace is that okay there might be my my karma because of which things are working in a particular way but karma is not the ultimate causative principle beyond that there is krishna so whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through it is that understanding which can be very helpful so we try to fix things at the immediate level but sometimes they can't be fixed at the immediate level we accept that okay this is this is probably due to my past karma but then we aspire to see the divine hand the divine grace in that situation and that's how we move ahead 
that's how we tackle problems effectively right that's a, a nice summary um i've got some comments from listening to i had i've interviewed Diego govinda on the problem of evil and also uh rambaru i've listened to some podcasts she's done she's worked as a yes a chaplain in hospitals and Diego govinda has worked as a counselor for abused children um and Dira Govindu, they both explained a similar kind of thing. Dira Govindu was explaining how he's seen some of these children on their own come to the realization that that this was my karma. Um, that, you know, this is a reaction for misdeeds I committed in a past life or something like that. But they, they might, may not have known any of the details, but they had this understanding in their heart um, that it was their karma. But this isn't Dira Govinda telling them, this is your karma, deal with it, or something like that. This came from then. And uh, like, like listening to, to Jordan Peterson explain how therapy sessions work with a psychologist, uh, what, a, what a good counselor does is reflect back what the other person's saying. So sometimes people do this and it sounds a bit patronizing where somebody says something and then they say back, oh, it sounds like what you're saying is this. And then they just repeat back to the person exactly what they said. But what a good counselor is doing is, is articulating what the person said in a way that makes it more clear what, what the person's saying, what the person's thinking. And then the person's actually doing the, the thinking themselves, but they're doing it out loud with another person as a sounding board. And in this way, the therapist is not actually steering them anywhere or feeding them any conclusions. The, the client or the patient is, is, being, is going on a journey and coming to their own realizations themselves. And this is how they're actually helped. If, if, if the counselor or therapist goes in there with opinions that they try to feed the client, it's not, it doesn't work. Um, it, what to speak and and, and and nor would it, and, and for the same reasons that it doesn't work telling a child it, it's your it's your karma that you're in this situation that your parents are getting divorced so and karma is a little bit uh, at least my understanding of it, it it's not so uh, detailed and and its effects so yeah we I might have karmas to have particular quality of parents but it's not my karma every single decision they make with their lives. So, you know, in a past life, I may have been a particular mm. poor quality or good quality of parent. And as a result of my interactions with other people and the qualities, the quality of person I've been to other people, I, I get similar kinds of quality of people in my life. But then life plays out and different people make different decisions and you get a certain quality of parents and they may be likely to, to, to divorce, but it may not necessarily be guaranteed that will happen because people are living their lives and they make choices and a low quality person can become a high quality person and the reverse can happen. Yeah, in, in some ways, a karma, if, even if we understand it properly, all that can it can give us is something like a weather forecast. So that means if I'm driving my car and I come to know that there's going to be stormy weather here, that can help me to drive think, drive more cautiously. Does it mean that necessarily I have to suffer from an accident? Maybe. But if I'm driving carefully, maybe the accident will be not as severe as if I'm driving recklessly. So in that sense, the, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't at all talk about predestination. Karma is not predestination at all. Karma is more like uh, a forecast of the kind of situations we are likely to encounter in our future. It is not at all uh, controlling, or it does not uh, it does not control how we deal with those situations. So that is not predestination. One way I explain it is that <clears throat> karma may de may determine the complexion of our face, but karma doesn't determine the expression on our face. Mm. And there is always the room for human agency. Yeah, right. Um, there's another point I like to make in response to objections to karma. Uh, and th they're genuine objections, uh, which is that s there's been some cases where people have seen a starving child and invoked the philosophy of karma to say, it's this child's karma to suffer, therefore... If I feed them, I will be interfering with their karma. Better I do nothing. And obviously, there's something wrong with that thought. We don't need to explain what's wrong with that. Um, but explaining how the doctrine of karma doesn't result in that 
uh, me- requires that we bring in the concept of dharma. So exactly, if there's a start, so exactly. karma is for how I look at myself. Like there's this, uh, um, in the Vedic tradition, there's this understanding of how the guru sees himself is a very different thing from how the disciple sees the guru. If the deci- if the guru is looking at himself the way the disciple is looking at the guru, then the guru is having a problem. The guru is supposed to be humble and see himself as a servant, not see himself as this great teacher who's here to save everybody. Um, so similarly well, with it's... karma, how I look at my life um, is based on karma. These things that are happening to me are my responsibility. But then when I see a starving child, I don't invoke karma for that. I invoke dharma. It's my duty to feed this child. And I have <laughs> various other duties and some things are beyond my duty. It's not my duty to feed, you know, say there's a hundred million starving children. That's that. That's not that goes beyond my duty. I couldn't possibly do that even if I tried. Agreed. Agreed fully. See, the, this is you brought a very critical point over here. Karma can never be the basis for formulating state policies. If a person is a criminal who has uh, who has robbed someone. And now the the head of state, the police, the justice department, whoever it is, they cannot say your victim. It was your own karma, and you have to suffer because of that. It is there to say what is our duty in this situation. During our day-to-day interactions with people, uh, during almost all social interactions, we need to function based on people's actions in this life, not based on whatever actions we assume they may have done in their previous lives. It is more for, as you said, a personal sense of acceptance. So let's take this example of a robbery. Somebody is robbed. And should they think that, oh, it was because of my own past karma I was robbed. So why even bother to catch the thief? Why even go and report the crime to the police? No. They have, they are a part of society. And a part of a functioning society uh, is to have order, law and order as we say so then that has to be maintained so Krishna uses the word dharma in both senses in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna uses the word dharma in terms of individual duty so Arjuna is asking what is my dharma Pruchami Tvam dharma cheta. but Krishna also says I descend to this world dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge I come to establish order in the world so there is individual duty and there is social order so uh, the the idea of karma is the idea of karma in terms of what I have done in the past and I'm getting the results of that now. That is not meant to deviate either us from our sense of our duty nor the broader social unit, family or country or whatever it is from its it to maintain order in society, maintain order in the larger social unit. So the idea is, okay, so if, if somebody is robbed, then they report to the proper authorities. The proper authorities responsibly try to search and try to find out what happened, what went wrong. And if after it all, nothing works out, then that is where that person can say, oh, okay, maybe it was my karma because of which I lost this. Let me accept it and move on. Let me not wallow in resentment or self-pity. Let me just continue on. Okay, sometimes some things get lost. But if the idea of karma is meant is used to detract us from doing our own dharma, that will lead to chaos in society. And where will you stop then? You know, in a newborn baby, when a baby comes out of the mother's womb, the baby is crying. Now, should the mother think, oh, you know, this baby is crying, it is in pain, he or she is in pain because of her own karma. So if I comfort her, then I'll be interfering with the karma. Well, that will lead to heartlessness. That's why that's why I talk about philosophy and psychology. Both are important. Philosophy talks about the nature of reality. Psychology talks about the nature of our emotions. So unless one understands the psychological aspect of how philosophy is applied, philosophy can actually end up making people heartless. The idea is, karma is, the purpose of karma, let's put it succinctly, the purpose of karma is not so much post-mortem as prognosis. 
not who did what in the past but what is the most resourceful what is the most effective way to move ahead given that we are in this situation not post mortem but prognosis when we start doing post mortem using it and we start doing post mortem analysis for the purpose of labeling and demeaning people or even labeling and demeaning ourselves that is disastrous um I'd also want to point out that that karma is not just like something that hits us and then we have to endure it like some kind of sentence. It's reactions that are tailored to correct a mentality which we still have, which caused us to commit those actions which earned this reaction. So if a particular thing happens to us, like say the child whose parents are splitting up, it's not just like, you know, it's supposing the child did come to realize uh, I, it was my karma to be born and and to, and have these kinds of parents it's not just a sentence that the child has to endure it's what what does god want me to learn from the situation what why am i here how can i benefit how how can i contribute and find meaning in this and grow and learn as a person and help other people grow and learn through facing the situation i'm in in a proper way so in the case of being robbed by a thief maybe this happens so that i can understand the problem of thievery and have more empathy for other people who were stolen from and learn that stealing's wrong and never steal myself and uh, learn proper systems of dealing with thieves and criminals so I can be part of preventing crime, at least doing my own little part by making sure this criminal is brought to justice, which de-incentivizes other people from committing crime and might help this criminal turn his life around. Yes, definitely. And that's a very balanced way of looking at it that the karma philosophy is applied in tamoguna and in the, i'm helpless and i can't do anything and just have to live in the misery that i am in the karma philosophy if it is if it is taken by somebody who's in rajoguna they will think that they will they'll just get consumed by a sense of self righteous rage and they'll say oh this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong well there are many things wrong in the world and if we start is making it our mission to correct everything wrong that is wrong in the world eventually we will end up becoming what is wrong in the world we can't tackle all the problems but we can say okay this is what i can fix and this is what i will work on fixing and that is how we move ahead in our lives right um i find it interesting the way you play the uh, apply the three gunas to so many different uh, like everything we talk about you can apply the gunas to it it, it reminds me of how Jer jordan peterson is always talking about the big five personality traits i don't not sure how much you've looked into yes. those and if, if they if there's any way to map them onto the three gunas or they the, i guess the three gunas are something that can happen to anybody of any psychophysical nature whereas the big five personality to straights if, if they were to map onto something maybe it would be the varnas because that's something that is sort of a psychophysical nature that you carry with you throughout your life yes you know this this could be a whole different podcast <laughs> yeah. and, and, gunas. and it's getting late but here we're gonna have to wrap quick, it up soon <laughs> yeah i think it's late for you but i'll make one quick point since you brought it up the gunas can be seen in two different ways one is that they themselves are personality types or human types and that this person is sattva this person is rajas this person is tamas and that is true at the same time each of these is a universe in itself that a person sattva can also have a very wide range of characteristics so we could see the gunas as three meta categories and then we could see various personality types as subcategories within these meta categories so for example we could have a introvert sattva sattva guna person we could have a extrovert sattva guna person we could have a introvert tamo guna person we could have a introvert rajo guna person and similarly introvert extra if that is the framework we are taking and similarly we could take uh, the enneagram nine personality types are there we could say that this is a sattva this is rajas this is tamas so we could see the gunas as meta categories hmm? but the other way of looking at it is that the gunas can also be seen as sub categories within these categories within any other personality test so one of the problems which comes up that if we consider the introvert and extrovert hmm? and what will happen is that 
there may be certain recommendations given for if a, if a introvert how they deal with situation like parties or extroverts how they deal with situations like say, retreats or meditation centers or something like that but you know all introverts and all extroverts are not the same even among them also there is a broad categorization and that's why so the gunas can be seen as one category categorization tool that can help us make sense of reality but they can also be seen as uh, like a meta categorical tools meta categorization tools that can help us use other categorization tools better so if um, the various personality character predominant personality characteristic like when he talks about say conscientiousness let's take the conscientiousness or openness so now conscientiousness is good but conscientiousness in the moguna can actually lead to obsessiveness like some people may have may be obsessive about cleanliness and they can become fastidious they can become they can become fanatical about it and that could be unhealthy so conscientiousness is good but a person in con- who has that con- high level of consciousness conscientiousness if they are in sattva guna that is far better than conscientiousness in rajoguna or tamoguna and similarly openness is good and generally these two will be considered as somewhat opposite but openness also in tamoguna could lead to complete abandonment of any kind of coherence or structure in one's life and that would be damaging so it would so that is one thing which we could discuss maybe in a future discussion sometime right it sounds like what you're saying is so the big five personality traits they describe different kinds of people so there's five personality traits you can be high or low in any of the five um and that gives you a different psychophysical nature on this model and as jordan peterson says that it, it has quite a it's quite a useful system it's it's simple it's it's accurate and it's beneficial to analyze this thing this way it sounds like what you're saying is so you take a person with a particular psychophysical nature uh as analyzed based on that system and we can use the gunas to analyze to examine whether they're the the their so, so for any given personality trait or psychophysical nature there's going to be pros and cons so if this person is to, if their quali- good qualities are coming out in a bad way this is how they'll manifest if if the person's in the mode of ignorance here's how it will look if the person is in the mode of passion here's how it would look so we could do this for any uh personality trait or um collection of personality traits uh but it also sounded like you were saying that people are are born with a particular um capacity for the mode of goodness or passion or ignorance or a predisposition towards that which might suggest that a person has only so far they could advance towards the mode of goodness in a given life but perhaps that's not what you want to say oh we've lost your sound again sure whether... oh no you're back you're back the fo- the oh okay i can hear you. okay the first part is definitely true so the first part that we all have a predisposition towards particular modes now how much can that be changed uh that will depend on a lot of factors so my understanding is the key factor would be uh what kind of environment they are living in and another factor would be is it necessary is it necessary for everybody to be completely in sattva guna no i mean for people who are say uh people who are in merchants or warriors or something or fighters they need a certain level of rajoguna also but the problem would be if that becomes the controlling defining influence yes we all can elevate our modes now exactly to what extent yeah it may not be always possible to change that completely for everyone but that may not be desirable also but understanding this can help us at least know where we are situated what resources are accessible for us and then we can uh, use those resources better so it's like if i am having a the bhavita uses the i maybe i'll conclude with this particular concept that there is the, the bhavita talks about the concept of kshetra and kshetragya in the 13th chapter so kshetra is like the field so when uh, uh, we and so if you consider the agricultural metaphor in a field if we plow properly we can get a get a good harvest but before one can sow and uh, plow one has to know 
what kind of land is there and what kind of soil is there and what will grow over here and what will not grow over here so similarly is it that uh, so similarly this the, the guna framework or other personality types analysis that is meant to help us understand the kind of land we have been given that is the kind of psychological disposition that we have the kind of um, body mind mesh structure that we have now if somebody has got a particular kind of si soil on their land now can they cultivate any kind of crop on it can say somebody in in a cold place they can cold mangoes require relatively warm or hot weather so oh, maybe with great effort it is possible but maybe that's not required for them they can cultivate some other fruits which are equally which are also delicious so the point is that person later can decide with this particular resource that i have what do i want to do with it but understanding what that resource is all about that itself is very helpful so so the gita has only two verses which it repeats almost fully one is talking about devotional harmony man mana bhav mad bhakto that krishna repeats in 934 and then 1865 and that is that we are all at our core spiritual beings and we need to lovingly harmonize with the ultimate reality but the other uh, other words that the gita repeats is shreyan sva dharma viguna para dharma sunushtita that is 335 and then 1847 1846 so what krishna talks about it is that we need to understand our nature and align with our nature that means understand the kind of land we have and then okay then in this particular land what is the harvest that i can grow the best so that is what the these personality tools uh, any fr any any framework for analyzing ourselves whether it is the guna framework or some other framework that is meant to give us an understanding of the kshetra the feel that we have the kind of uh, body mind machine that we have been given and then how we can put it to optimal use okay right yeah nice points um thank you very much for sharing all that i i queued a whole bunch of jordan peterson clips but which, which we didn't get to many of because we had so much to talk about um but that's fine um thank you very much for sharing yes so, so let me try to quickly summarize if you are okay with what oh, we yeah, discussed oh yeah just just to give a quick quick point <laughs> chaitanya yeah. charan yeah. is a so, bit of a shruti dara he does podcasts yeah. on his channel do a whole two hour podcast ranging all sorts of things with highly intellectual guests and sophisticated subjects and then he'll summarize the entire podcast in a couple of minutes right at the end mm, i'm not sure about the entire <laughs> but yeah so <laughs> so it we discussed about parallels in jordan peterson's approach to approach analysis and application uh, of reality along to bhagavita's approach analysis and application uh, in its exploration of reality so first we started by talking about why are mental health problems so much more so one thing i discussed is that the external structures whether they be family or society or or a particular sense of one's duty in the world those external structures they have been ruptured and that's why although we have a greater level of physical comforts still there is greater distress so we need not just pleasure or comfort but we need meaning and then uh, is distress helpful is a certain level of distress helpful in bringing out mental toughness De definitely because at one level the three level reality if we consider the physical mental and spiritual at the physical level distress is unavoidable but how we can process that distress that depends on the world view with which we can find some meaning in life so pleasure is too fragile and too trivial a, a purpose to sustain us to life's pleasures life's troubles life's challenges then when we talk about structure and we talk about structure world view one extreme could be reject them all that will be terrible but the other is to accept one irrationally and just hold on to it that can lead to fanaticism so the uh, so avoiding nihilism and fanaticism we can have a rationally understood and a rationally accepted 
structure for meaning and purpose that is what the gita offers and then within the gita's framework it talks about uh, we we spend a good amount of time analyzing the three modes which are ways in which matter and consciousness interact uh, that how we perceive reality how we process reality outside us and how we what we pursue within that reality that's what is shaped, shaped by the modes then we talked about the pleasure and purpose so at the cost of purpose and sometimes even at the cost of pleasure that's when a person becomes addictive then in rajoguna there's a tension between pleasure and purpose and sometimes purpose can win sometimes pleasure can win and in rasatvaguna there is the willingness to subordinate or to sacrifice pleasure for some higher purpose and that's where we discuss the difference between humans and animals where animals they also have distress they also go through distress but we humans are vulnerable to greater level of distress because we have the consciousness advanced enough to perceive the future and so animals may be victimized by climate change but we humans can see the victim that the catastrophe coming and this capacity for advanced uh, of foreseeing the future of perceiving the bigger picture if that is not done properly that's where we talk about philosophy and psychology you know if i can have a, if somebody has a philosophical view of the world but then they can just sink into negativity and despair thinking that there is so much distress what is the point of it all but philosophy has to be and process with psychology properly so that is that this world is dukkhala it's a place of distress just like the himalayas are going to be a place of extreme snow snow and cold but beyond that there is beauty there is challenge there is adventure there is achievement so that is what the acceptance of distress followed by aspiration for some meaning that's what the gita offers and this connection the gita's teaching of detachment is very empowering because if we are fixated only on our goals and the pleasure that the goal will give us then if those goals don't come or the goal don't turn out to be fulfilling we can just be miserable uh but if we can be detached from the results then we don't worry so much about whether we are making a difference as we are making a contribution in making a contribution we are making a difference in our own world we are rising from a lower mode towards the higher modes so another way of understanding the modes is in tamoguna we underestimate our capacity to change things in rajoguna we overestimate in satvaguna we actually estimate accurately then uh, it discussed elaborately about karma and dharma that karma is about it's not meant for post mortem yes it is meant to help us gain a sense of acceptance when things are not changeable for us but it is not meant to abandon our responsibility to do things that are doable for us like if a person is in a canoe in a in a ocean then if they are paddling wrong and endangering themselves they need to stop that but if suddenly the tide rises some huge waves come they need okay i can't do much about it except it so the either the immediate cause which needs to be dealt with there is the remote cause which needs to be acknowledged and accepted and ultimately there is the ultimate cause which is our disconnection from the divine and if you can realign with the divine then even if karma because of karma things go wrong whatever karma may get us to krishna will get us through uh, so that is where the divine factor of divine grace comes in and with respect to the modes and personality types you can say the modes can be seen as one personality uh, type analysis but they can also be seen as uh, category uh, meta categories that can help us make better sense of other categorization tools and how much can we change our uh, gunas well it depends on how much we want, need to change also but the guna framework can help us understand the kind of field we have and then we can decide what we want to harvest over there what is feasible for us and then we can uh, have as good a harvest as is possible thank you very much hare krishna cool thank you hare krishna